Stem cell winds blow hot and cold. And uh, I be, have been a critic sometimes of some people, but now am a very strong advocate, especially about uh, what our first speaker spoke about, Ted. Uh, Neurostem has been moving their trials and pricing needle forward, and I'm very proud to in introduce Richard Garr, your Chief Executive Officer from Neurostem. I'm really not going to talk too much about the usual things here. I want to talk about the trial today. You met Ted Harada, who was patient 11 in our trial. Um, so this is, we have actually started the phase two to treat Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, it's a terrible disease. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, there is nothing actually that either significantly improves the quality of life for patients or extends their life. Um, what we are doing, uh, and I'm going to actually show you a film, and I ask your apologies since I know it's right before lunch, but you're going to see a little film of the surgery. Um, but what we're doing, we're the world's first intraspinal injections. So we're actually injecting cells into the gray matter of the spinal cord. It's a very focal surgery. I don't know if there's a laser pointer up here or not. I don't think so. Um, but if you look down there, you can see, if you think of the spinal cord going up like this, the different segments, the motor neurons die selectively in, in ALS patients. And the motor neurons shoot out processes that innervate the muscles. And basically, when the muscles that control breathing and swallowing atrophy, the patients die. On average, two to four years from diagnosis. Um, so what we're doing is putting in spinal cord cells. Our technology are human neural stem cells. They're regionally specific. This isn't one cell that you can push to a certain fate. Um, these aren't cells that rely on the microenvironment, unknown factors. These are cells that already have in them all the information to become fully functional, physiologically relevant cells from wherever we get them. These particular cells that are in these patients are spinal cord cells. And when they differentiate, they differentiate about 75% into GABAergic neurons and to glia. And so we put the cells in. Um, we've done 20 surgeries now, 18 in the phase one. And uh, six patients did die. Uh, they all had volunteered for autopsy. And so we have data from, I believe, nine months to 30 months out from surgery, which shows in every case that the cells survived and lived as long as the patient. And that was, by the way, um, regardless of whether or not the patients had gone off of the immunosuppression drug. So the FDA protocol for our trial uh, for the ALS patients was immunosuppressions for life as tolerated. About half the patients went off the immunosuppressant drug in a fairly uh, quick time. Um, and we don't see any difference. Uh, we have been approved to do a spinal cord injury trial, chronic spinal cord injury by the FDA, which will start this year, I believe, out in California. Um, and the protocol there calls for three months as tolerated immunosuppression. So you can see the FDA getting more comfortable as it goes by. Anyway, what we're doing here, and what's important to understand, is the cells, even though they graft and create new circuitry, in spinal cord injury, that actually provides the benefit. In ALS, it's trophic factors that are providing the benefit. What we're doing with these cells is actually surrounding and supporting and nurturing the remaining motor neurons at each segment that we transplant them in. Uh, and there are some cells that are, if you think about it, um, there is a tipping point, you know, that are sick but not dead. And some of those can be brought back to health. And that's why, for instance, when you look at um, Ted's data, um, this is, uh, what is that, about seven, 800 days out. Eva Feldman, who is our, our uh, overall PI, is publishing a lot more data soon. I think it'll be this month, maybe next month. But she started to speak about it publicly. Now, this is Ted's cohort. Um, the final data will show benefit across all cohorts. Um, now, Ted's cohort, these three patients received 10 lumbar injections and five cervical injections, 100,000 cells per injection. In the phase two, we will be dosing up to um, 40 injections, 20 cervical, 20 lumbar with 400,000 cells per injection. So 
you heard earlier people talk about the FDA and about the regulatory hurdles. It took us three years to get the phase one completed. Um, but as a critic, I have to also acknowledge when they do a good job. And the FDA really stepped up to the plate for this trial. It's been clear that this can help and that it's safe. And um, they gave us a very aggressive protocol. Um, we announced a little while ago that we had transplanted the first patient at Emory in the phase two trial. Um, we have, uh, within the very near future, we'll be announcing, I suspect, that we finished the entire first cohort. Uh, again, out of respect to the patients, um, we're not going to give specifics until the actual sites do. But um, we basically, for this trial, will do three patients a month, wait a month, and then do three more patients, and dose up with each uh, successive cohort. <clears throat> um, this will allow us to do the entire phase two dosing in under a year, assuming things go, you know, as we hope. Uh, so that's a, a, a tremendous improvement. We then will watch the patients for six months after the last surgery. So we'll have 18 months data from the first guys and six months from the second. And uh, that will be the end of the, um, of the phase two. Again, what you're seeing here, and it, there'll be updated data, but the remarkable part about this is you're not seeing lines that go down. So the new publication actually will show you what the projected trend would have been for these patients. You'll see a huge delta. But what you're seeing here is on the overall ALS SFRS, which is sort of the clinically accepted scale right now, um, the patients go a very, very long time, these are over two years out, without any progression of the disease symptoms. So this is our goal, right, is to make this a chronic disease that you can live with. Um, and, and right now, the, the, uh, the data is very encouraging. Now, I wanted to, because it's a little different, excuse me, um, I'm going to show you the actual surgery. And then we'll uh, I'll take some questions if there's time. Because people talk about neural stem cell transplantation. But you have to really see this to understand what's really going on. So here's a patient. It's not Ted, by the way, an earlier patient preparing for surgery. This is very invasive, right? Minimally invasive surgery is something that's done on somebody else, not you, generally speaking. But, but this, is, this is the real deal. Um, again, I can move this down a little. You can see what we're actually doing here, right? This is a targeted surgery. So this doesn't go into the intrathecal cavity and float around and we hope that somehow something works, right? These cells are going in very specific places, right, to, to perform a very specific function. Sorry. Yeah. All right, these were taken by John Glass, by the way, during the surgery. Again, here's a schematic. So we're putting the cells in the motor neuron pools near the ventral horn. This is where they are. Doesn't do any good to put the cells anywhere else. This is where the cells that are dying live. And if you're gonna save those cells, this is where you have to put the medicine. Real-time uh, fluoroscopy, obviously. So we are now opening up the patient. The retractors go in. Um, as you can see, this is fairly invasive surgery, okay? Now, the reason I'm showing you this is to let you know, when we originally budgeted this trial, and you can see this is fairly invasive. We had these patients being in an ICU for a week and then a step-down unit for a week. And almost all the patients went home after three or four days. Right? So, so everything worked extremely well. Here you can see the, the needle being loaded. So it's worth talking about this. There are a couple problems. As I said, this is the world's first intraspinal surgery. And one of the problems you have is that the spinal, even, even under anesthesia, as you can imagine, the patient moves up and down a little. The spinal cord moves a little. And if you put a hard needle inside a moving spinal cord, you can do a lot of damage. So this um, device, which uh, was developed by Nick Boulis, our surgeon, when he was at the Cleveland Clinic, is actually hooked up to the patient, not to the bed frame. So if somebody accidentally bumps the bed frame or something happens, the entire device is moving with it, with the patient, uh, to prevent that. The other part of the um, surgery, and you're going to actually see the surgery now. So this is um, the human spinal cord, and you can see the, the needle in it. 
And again, I'm going to stop it here and show you this hard needle, right, that has to penetrate the spinal cord. And you can see, right, from all the veins there, that this is why you have to open the patient up, right, to, to prevent bleeding. Yet the surgeon has to be able to physically see what they're doing to do this. And so as these cells are being fed in, and it takes about two to three minutes for each injection. Again, these were 100,000 cells per injection. We'll bring up to 400,000 cells per injection. Um, you'll start to see right about there, you see the, the hard part of the needle pull up. And what's left in here is called a floating cannula. This was also invented by Dr. Bullis. So you can see it going up there. And that's because, as you can see, this isn't just a doctor with nervous hands. The spinal cord actually has its own pulse, right? And it vibrates a little. And again, if you had a hard needle inside a vibrating spinal cord, you could shear the cord. And so we have this uh, floating cannula, it's called, also developed by Nick when he was at the Cleveland Clinic, um, to make sure that that doesn't cause any damage. And again, we've now done 20 surgeries, um, both lumbar and cervical, and um, we've had no damage done from the surgeries, no significant uh, adverse events. Um, we've been, knock on wood, uh, very cautious. Now this, as you see, is it's serious surgery. And basically what we do is we just go up. You're seeing here from this particular, this was an early patient who only had five injections unilaterally. Then patients got 10 injections, which was five on each side. Again, as we get to the second trial, um, further down the line, the first patient, I think, had um, 20 injections with 200,000 cells, I'm sorry, 10 five bilateral each uh, with 200,000 cells per injection. In cohorts of three, we'll be working up to 40 injections, 20 in the cervical area, 20 in the lumbar, uh, with 400,000 cells per injection. We believe that that's the maximum safe tolerated dose, um, and that's where we're headed. So let me show you one other thing. Again, what you're looking at here, this is actually preclinical data. But the reason that I'm, I'm bringing it up is to, again, what I'm trying to show you is I'm not interested in the rodent survival, although it is sort of interesting. It's this graph right here, okay? And again, this is what's providing the benefit to the patients. These are motor neurons. And when we put our cells in, you can tell from the control, and this is a SOD1 model. It's a model of ALS that's, that's used. Um, it isn't ALS, but it shares a lot of the same terrible symptoms in the animals. Um, and then you can see clearly the naked eye. You don't even have to look at the graph. We, have, we see a lot more motor neurons surviving, right? That's what kills patients, right? That's what the, the horrible part of the disease. The motor neurons in the central nervous system die. You no longer have innervation of any of the muscles. Sorry, so that's what we're doing. And it's worth understanding that um, because that's why the more is better theory works, right? The more segments of the spinal cord we can transplant, the more cells we can get in safely, the more cells we can save, and the more cells we can possibly nurture back to health, as Eva says. So again, real quickly, uh, um, We'll move down, talk a little bit about the phase two trial. Um, the, the publication will come out soon, so I can't talk about the exact data, but Eva has been talking about it publicly. So I can tell you again that we have already transplanted two of the three patients in the first protocol. Another big thing about this trial is this is the first trial, our phase two, where we're moving out from Emory. So all 18 surgeries in the first trial were done by Nick Boulos at Emory. Um, even though we just saw the device Nick invented, there's nothing exotic in this surgery. There isn't anything we don't believe could be done at any you know, high quality neurosurgery center anywhere in the world, more or less the US. And so in this phase two, we're doing patients at Emory and at Michigan and at Mass General. Um, and so we're going to have three different surgical teams working on it. We need to show that not only is the 
procedure robust and repeatable, but that there's no magic in Nick's hands. And apologies to Nick, but uh, I think it's pretty clear that, that any you know, neurosurgeon can do this. Um, we have a very active training program. So we fly the surgeons down, they observe the surgeries, they train on pigs. There is a mini pig that has a very similar size spinal cord to humans. Um, we have centers set up actually around the world um, because as a company we're doing things in a lot of different places. But in terms of ALS, um, you know, we expect to try and take advantage. Again, it's always data permitting, right? But assuming we see the same encouraging data that we saw in the phase one, we believe it'll be better in the phase two. Um, we are hoping to be able to take advantage of some of the new tools that the FDA has been given uh, in the PDUFA legislation. Um, this is certainly the kind of disease, I think, where it was anticipated to be able to use those tools. Uh, we work with NORD, who's up here in Boston. Um, there's a lot of uh, movement now uh, in the industry and academia to push towards these rare diseases. Uh, ALS, you know, is one of the larger, but it still fits in that category. There's about five to 7,000 new diagnoses a year, about 30,000 patients in the U.S. Unfortunately, that number stays pretty much the same because they all die. Uh, and so, um, as Ted was saying earlier, you know, this is an area where um, we need for industry and for the regulatory bodies to understand that the, the risk assessment here has to be different, right? You have a patient population that's extremely well um, educated by their doctors. Um, they understand the risks, but uh, there are no alternatives. This isn't cancer where there are treatments. There's nothing right now. Uh, and so um, we will be with Ted every step of the way pushing them uh, to, to push this forward, um, again, as long as the data uh, supports us. And right now, it looks very encouraging.